Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is wonderful to see you here tonight. I am Jeff Rosen, the president of this spectacular institution, the National Constitution Center, which, as those of you who have been here before know, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And we are doing that in our superb town hall programs this fall, which will culminate in the end of October with our opening of a new gallery displaying one of the 12 original surviving copies of the Bill of Rights. This is well worth applauding. It is a thrilling moment for the National Constitution Center to be basically the only place in the country, aside from the National Archives, that will have in one place rare copies of the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. And we're gonna tell the story of the relationship between those documents with a beautiful gallery with uh, 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 an interactive uh, with Constitute, the leading database of global constitutions that lets you trace the spread of the liberties of the Bill of Rights across the globe and, and uh, artistic renditions of each of the 10 amendments to the Constitution commissioned by Philadelphia artists that you can see in the gallery and online and an incredible opening ceremony at the end of October with Justice Samuel Alito, Governor Jeb Bush and the Philadelphia Opera and Orchestra playing patriotic music and it's gonna be an amazing, amazing event and you have to all come and see it. But that's not all because in the days leading up to this great gallery we have an incredible series of programs and debates about the Constitution. We opened our fall season with a bang last week on Constitution Day and we're privileged to host Justice Anthony Kennedy and Senators uh, Ted Cruz and Kristen Gillibrand, not at the same time, uh, <laughs> both talking about the Constitution. And in the weeks ahead, let's see, uh, next week, October 6th, we have uh, a great uh, event on the forgotten presidents and their constitutional legacy. Then the next day on October 7th, this great debate with our friends at Intelligence Squared, does the president have the power to collect cell phone metadata without a warrant? Does that violate the Fourth Amendment? Uh, and then uh, our great award of the Liberty Medal to Malala on October 21st. Um, it's just gonna be a phenomenal fall. That uh, uh, brings me to my privilege, which is to introduce tonight's program, which is co-produced with our great friends across the street at WHYY, the best public radio station in the country, and this is the crown jewel of our partnership is co-sponsoring uh, events like this. Uh, you will hear uh, our good friend uh, at HYY, uh, in particular Chris Satulo, who's the Vice President of News and Civic Dialogue. He will um, be our in interviewer and moderator tonight. He was editorial page editor and columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer before coming to HYY, and he's a co-founder of the Penn Project for Civic Engagement at the University of Pennsylvania, which convenes forums to connect citizen concerns to journalism. Chris and I are planning a podcast series on the Bill of Rights leading up to the opening of the gallery, and I've got to start doing my homework so that I am prepared to answer his questions. And he will be interviewing the leading scholar of Thomas Jefferson in the United States. Professor Annette Gordon-Reed uh, consulted and helped to curate the incredibly impressive exhibit on Jefferson and slavery, which was created by Monticello and appears downstairs. And if you haven't seen it, for goodness sake, please do. It's closes on October 19th, so you just have a few more weeks. And tonight you'll hear her um, discuss her new book uh, uh, about uh, Jefferson. She is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard and also a professor of history at Harvard. She will be a visiting professor of American history at Queens College, Oxford during uh, the 2014 academic year. She received the 2008 National Book Award and the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History for the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family, and is the author of several other books, including Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American controversy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Annette Gordon-Reed and Chris Satulo. Thank you, Jeffrey, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to see you all here. Great to be here with Professor Gordon Reed. Uh, just a quick word about the plan for the evening. Uh, we'll talk for about 40 minutes, um, uh, 
going over this scholarship and uh, Professor Gordmead's books. Uh, you're getting uh, note cards. You can write questions down the note cards. They'll be passed up and we'll devote the last third of the hour to your questions. So um, I'm sure most of you know that you're sitting in the presence of a person, a historian who has reshaped our understanding of one of the most important founding figures of the United States and also reshaped our understanding of the most fateful institution in the history of our country, slavery. Um, and uh, I guess my first question is, why Jefferson? How, how did a law professor get into this work? Well, why Jefferson? Because he's a good topic to talk about. <laughs> it's a good topic to talk that about. That has been demonstrated. It's been demonstrated, a good topic to talk about slavery, uh, the beginnings of America, the American contradiction with sla um, slavery and race. Um, he's a subject that I've been interested in for quite a long time because I started out thinking about what it was like to be a person who had written the Declaration of Independence, but at the same time was a slave owner, um, a person who talked about the equality of mankind, but at the same time expressed suspicions about black people's um, uh, inferiority. And all of these things sort of went together and reminded me pretty much of what the American experience has been like, the sort of American conflict that we've had in sort of dealing with how do you get groups of people who are different, different races, different colors, uh, but particularly different races to live together in an American democracy. And that was the, the, the struggle, the question that he asked and got himself into a lot of trouble about it. But He's a good subject. He's a good place to start in investigating all these issues. And your method uh, became to investigate that history from the ground up, looking at people and voices who had been ignored or diminished or left out of the picture and zeroed in on um, the family, the Hemingses mm -hmm. of Monticello. Uh, there's some complicated genealogy here. Perhaps we should take a moment to uh, sort of lay out. <laughs> Lay out the facts so everyone sort of has the thread. Uh, okay. Uh, there was a woman named Elizabeth Hemings who was born in 1735. She was the daughter of an Englishman, an English ship captain is their family story, and a woman who may have been born of a in Africa but was actually, or, or if not, was, was a full-blood African is the term that, that, that was used in their family. Um, she was born in the Williamsburg area in Virginia and during the time that she was born, as a matter of fact, was the sort of high tide of the importation of Africans into um, Virginia during that time period. So this is a mixed race woman who is enslaved by a family called the Epses, who, was, who are an old family from Virginia. And she grew up in the Epps household and a man named John Wales, who was an English immigrant, um, married into the Epps family, and when his wife died, um, Elizabeth, called Betty sometimes, came under his ownership. John Wales had three wives, and after the death of his third wife, he took Elizabeth Hemings as a concubine. That is the phrase that their grandson uses to describe uh, their relationship. Uh, and she had six children with him. She also had uh, six children with other men you know, besides John Wales. So John Wales were, uh, uh, all of the, those siblings were, they were all one and they were with, with him. And the eldest was a boy named Robert and the youngest was a daughter named Sarah. Um, and Sarah was Sally Hemings. So John Wales, six children with Elizabeth Hemings. Uh, and one of the things about the book is I have these elaborate family trees because everybody has the same name. You know, they're all naming each other one, and you're just trying to figure out who is whom, who is which Sally, which Martha, which Elizabeth, those three names keep popping up. Um, so John Wales is a, is a wealthy um, planter and farmer in Virginia. In most Jefferson biographies, he had been described as a man who was trained as a lawyer in England. But I did some research on him and determined or found out, someone had given me a lead, and I did some more research to find out that he was actually a servant in England who had been brought over 
to America by a very wealthy man who saw him as very intelligent and talented and educated him. So there's a big difference between being someone who is trained as a lawyer in England during that time period and being a servant. If you're trained as a lawyer in England, I mean, there were probably some farmer sons who went to the bar, but for the most part, we're talking about a middle class background or upper middle class background, uh, not aristocrats, because aristocrats did do trade, but um, a well-off person. Well, that's not who he was. He was a servant who made good. And he had a daughter named Martha uh, after his wife, who died. And that Martha married Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson and Martha uh, moved to Monticello. And the year after that, John Wales died. And so at this point, Jefferson came into the ownership of John Wales's property, including 135, around 130, 35 enslaved people, uh, including the Hemings family. Um, the Hemingses are, from the very beginning, are treated differently from the other enslaved people on the plantation. Jefferson has uh, had a uh, manservant who had been with him for many, many years, who was the same age, actually. And we think that this man's mother was Jefferson's wet nurse. Um, but they had been constant companions. Um, and he removes this man from his being his valet and takes Robert Hemings, his wife's half-brother, enslaved brother, as his no man servant. He's 12. So Robert begins to travel around with Jefferson. He is in with, he's with um, uh, Jefferson here in Philadelphia when he's writing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the Hemings women become the maids to Martha. Uh, so you get a sense that these are her father's children by this enslaved woman. But instead of sort of putting them away, um, they sort of bring them into their inner circle. And when Martha dies, it is Sally Hemings and her sister and Martha's white sister and a white sister-in-law who are around the bed with Jefferson as she's dying. And the family legend is that, family lore is that Martha gives Sally Hemings a memento to remember her by before she dies. So this is the family situation, uh, a convoluted Virginia family with tangled bloodlines. Uh, that get further t entangled when later on Jefferson becomes involved with Sally Hemings and has children with Sally Hemings, with his wife's half-sister. And the moment of Martha's death is also the moment where that sort of sets up many of the complications where she supposedly makes Jefferson take her Yes, and, and the, the Hemings family story told to one of Jefferson's overseers was that around, while they were around the bed that she made Jefferson promise never to remarry. Um, and the reason she said, they say she said she didn't want to be married is that she did not want another woman over her children. Um, she, her mother had died when she was like two weeks old. She'd never known her mother. And as I said, her father had married twice after that. And she was very close to her sisters, but you kind of wonder if there was perhaps not some tension um, in having two stepmothers if that's why it wasn't, you know, don't marry again because I want to, you know, have you forever, you know, in some sort of mystical, you know, mythical, mystical romance across death, but I don't want a woman over my children. So that's the Hemings family story about Jefferson, uh, pro and he promised not mm -hmm. to remarry. And at this time, he's 38 years old. Um, he lived to be 83, and he never remarried. Um, so after Martha's death, this sets up another fateful thing because Jefferson is distraught. He decides to take a, um, um, uh, an appointment in France and he takes over his eldest daughter and Sally Hemings' older brother, James Hemings, to teach him how to become a French chef. So this is the era of Jefferson in Paris. Met, some of you may have been unfortunate enough to see <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson in Paris. Um, Jefferson in Paris. So um, at some point, Sally Hemings comes over with Jefferson's daughter, younger daughter, brings her over. And it is there that Madison Hemings, Sally Hemings' son, says that Jefferson and Hemings began their connection, relationship, whatever it is you want to call it. I'm sure people are going to ask me about that later on. Um, so. This is this family story of, of Monticello. And if you go to the exhibit, 
all of the people that we're talking about are, are named there. The pictures of their descendants are there. And some part of the oral history of their family and the documentary history of their family. So that's this world with this man who was the president of the United States, um, who even at the time was chided by people for being a slave owner at the same time as he talked about the Declaration of Independence, talked about republicanism, the, the doctrine of republicanism, that people should uh, be able to vote um, for their leaders. And then how can you do that if you have these people here in bondage? And um, so there, there are these two documents, I should say. There's the Declaration on one side, and then there's a book that Jefferson wrote called Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he says a number of unfortunate things about slavery. He's, he's afraid because he says slavery, he, he has a really, really um, some strong words against slavery. And what frightens him is that people are going to read those words at the time and really get ticked off at him. But in fact, <laughs> it's the words about African Americans and you know, venturing it as a suspicion only that blacks are, are inferior to whites. It's suspicion only. I mean, you know, he, he believed that blacks were inferior to whites. But, you know, trying to be the scientist, he doesn't want to say it's definitely the case. Um, he takes some um, uh, some story about you know th about black men um, preferring white women in the way that orangutans prefer black women in Africa, you know, which he'd gotten out of um, a book by a man named Edward Lang. I mean, he'd never been to Africa and never seen an orangutan in his life, but. There he is being, you know, sort of these offhand comments that I think he would be stunned if he were here to understand that that is those things that have sort of put him beyond the pale for many people and not the things he had to say about slavery. Um, so this is the lesson is you never know what your legacy is going to be. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't shape the way because you don't know what things were going to... Even, even for a man who was as concerned as he... Oh, absolutely. And he tried different. very, very hard to shape his legacy, but you can't, you don't know. Every generation of people asks different questions of this material. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're asking different questions of the, the things that you're seeing on, in the exhibit. Uh, scholars 50 years ago had a totally different set of questions about Jefferson, and we will be supplanted later on. Some people will come along with other kinds of questions. That's just the way it is. Uh, reading your book, I'm struck by how it seems, or at least feels, that your uh, authorial voice is in this tension between some admiration and, and, a, and a willingness to certainly credit Jefferson for kindness and his breadth of in intellect, but just an exasperation <laughs> with what an all-time, well, shall we say, compartmentalizer or hypocrite he was, his ability to say one thing here and act in a different way over there. Well, you know, the hypocrite, we're all kind of hypocritical. Mm. I mean, he's hypocritical about a big thing, all right? <laughs> you know, it's a big thing, but there, you know, I mean, there'll be things that people will look at 100 years from now and say, you know, what were they thinking driving in those cars? Didn't they know yeah. that <laughs> they were gonna, you know, drive up our temperature, you know, to five degrees and, and kill us all? I mean. I do have a sense of admiration for the energy, for the dedication, um, for the contributions. But there, there's a lot there to, to be exasperated about. And as a biographer, I'm going to be doing a two-volume two biography of Jefferson. Um, as a biographer is not, I mean, most people think that you do biographies of people because you either love them or hate them. And some people do biographies because they hate people and they want to stick it to them, right? <laughs> um, and then there's the people who love the person and just want to extol it. I, to me, it's interesting what makes people tick. I want to know what makes um, uh, this individual tick. And this individual, because there isn't anybody in his time, maybe since then, who had his hand in so many different aspects of American life. The revolution, I mean, he was a governor, secretary of state, vice president, president. Uh, an ambassador, uh, he was involved in the revolution, he helped found West Point, uh, the Library of Congress start, was started with his books. I mean, every single thing you look at here, he's somewhere around here. And you can 
he's a way into so many different topics, Jefferson and Native Americans, Jefferson and race, Jefferson and slavery, Jefferson and politics, Jefferson and cooking. I mean, the, the, one of the questions, someone, someone told me that they get more questions at Monticello about Jefferson and recipes and cooking than anything. <laughs> Botany, you, you name it. He, his interests were just boundless. And to think of somebody, he said, How, who is this person who thinks that he can inject himself into the world in that way? And there isn't really anybody, anybody like that. His boundless curiosity and his ability to actually um, do remarkable things in so many fields, though, lies on the structure of the fact that he had a huge core of slaves exactly. in Virginia supporting him in every way. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to read one thing you say, uh, a couple of things you say in the book. Uh, Jefferson needed, you're talking about the Hemings brothers here, but generally it goes for the entire slave culture, uh, to remain in slavery for this to work in the manner that best suited his emotional needs, living as objects of his benevolence and protection. And you also say that uh, in many occasions that Jefferson had thoughts about what he wanted to do, but seems to almost always have been checked by the practical realities of what it would do to him if he didn't have the support structure mm -hmm. yeah. around him. Um, but you tell the story, it, it's remarkable to see as it develops over the course of the book, that you insist on telling the story from the point of view of uh, the slaves, who yeah. were individuals in their own right, who saw things, who experienced things, mm -hmm. who lived out the contradictions or the, the evil of the culture. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you as a historian, given that it's unclear whether uh, Sally Hemings was uh, literate, her brothers were literate but mm -hmm. didn't leave much behind, as a historian, what is the challenge of sort of imaginatively, sympathetically getting into the minds of people who left very little record behind for you. Well, you, you can't get into the minds. It's difficult to get in the minds of people who left things written. Because people write a lot of things. And they write in ways that are very self-conscious. Um, and so you have to be skeptical about that as well. But there's an extra burden uh, when you don't have letters from people. Um, all you can do is to think about what it is that they do. And if if all you have is the actions that they take, um, you have to use that. I mean, there's it, it, not anything that's perfect, but rather than just say, we don't have letters, we don't have those things, uh, those kinds of things you normally use in history that we don't do anything at all, I think readers understand the problem. They understand mm -hmm. that you're dealing with people who are, who are kept from keeping those kinds of records. So you use whatever it is that, use whatever that you have. Uh, and to try to pull it together. And I think, well, I mean, I, I tell a story about, um, you know, Sally Hemings going over to France um, at age 14. And when she gets there, she has to be inoculated. Um, and inoculation was a really scary process. They actually gave you a version of smallpox, not vaccination. It was, it was an, um, a variolation. They actually gave you the smallpox virus, not the cowpox is what they use for us. And you had to be sent away for 40 days. Uh, 40 days was made up from the Bible, you know, out mm -hmm. in the wilderness. It wasn't a scientific <laughs> thing. But 40 days in quarantine. So you, you imagine a girl who's 15, 14 years old. You're, you come there, you, somebody gives you smallpox, the version of smallpox. You're in a way, in a, in a, in a, you know, out somewhere by yourself uh, with people who don't speak your language. And I don't know that that she, I don't have a letter from her saying that was an intense experience or a scary experience, but I think if I tell that story, readers can connect to that. And I, a man came up to me once um, at a talk and said, you know, when I was reading that, I was thinking about my grandmother who came to um, the United States from Ellis Island, I was mean, to Ellis Island from Italy when she was 16 years old. She didn't speak any English at all, and she was supposed to be met here by relatives. But he was thinking, you know, about being alone. You know, we're social creatures, and we rely on one another. And being alone in a situation like that, the story of Sally Hemings made him think of his, of his uh, grandmother, who was not an 18th century enslaved woman, but was a human being 
who was in a situation where she was by herself. And that's what you want to do. I mean, you, if you can't get the actual words, you want the person who's reading to make a connection to say, these are people. These are human beings. And when I grew up reading books about slavery and reading books about uh, or Jefferson and other kinds of things, I didn't get the sense. Well, I'm, I'm pulling punches. There was no sense <laughs> that the African American people in the story were real people. That that th it was written in a way that was designed to distance them from the reader. I mean, even the use of dialect. I mean, Southern whites had accents, but you never see Southern white people's accents rendered in the way they actually speak in these books. You know, it's, very, it's a rare, unless oh, he's a low, oh, he's Ashley, a low class person. Ashley. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, it's, it's a way of distancing, making black people seem sort of otherworldly. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do here is to give people um, a stake in these folks so that they don't just see them as you know, generic enslaved man and ge generic enslaved woman, and here are the experiences that you could expect they would have, and here's how they would respond. So it, so it really is, and one of the things I want to say is that you often hear people say, well, we have to write and think about these things through their eyes, but they never say who they are. Mm -hmm. they, their eyes usually are the most powerful people in the story, and most people tend to want to identify with powerful people. You know, you're reading a book, you want to be, they want to be the person who is acting, the one who's not acting upon. What I'm trying to get here is to, is to have people uh, see it through the eyes of the Hemingses. I mean, see it through Jefferson's eyes when it's, a, uh, it's appropriate, but to talk about Robert Hemings in, in old books, other books about Jefferson, uh, Robert Hemings is described as Bob, Jefferson's slave. Well, Robert Hemings is his wife's half brother. And it changes how you think about the nature of that relationship, the nature of Jefferson's life, to know that he's going around with somebody who is a blood relative to his wife, a blood relative to his legal white daughters. And so those kinds of things, anything you can do to make you think that these are, these are human beings here, all of them, who are operating in this world, not some uh, category of master, some category of, of, of slave that is sort of like a cardboard cutout. I'd like to stay with the uh, Paris interlude, if we could, for a moment, because mm -hmm. you make very vivid there something I didn't understand at all, that when Thomas Jefferson took Robert's brother James oh. and, mm -hmm. and then brought Sally over, mm -hmm. under the law of France, they were entirely capable of emancipating themselves using the laws of France, mm -hmm. which Jefferson ignores and which they don't avail themselves of. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. kind of dynamic there. Could you go into mm -hmm. that a little bit? Well, French law um, was not, some people thought of it, and Jefferson actually thought that it was like you know, the, a free soil, that it, once you got there, you were automatically free. What it really was is that you had to petition the Admiralty Court. You had to go and petition for Freedom. And every enslaved person who petitioned for freedom in France, in Paris, uh, where they were during the 18th century, had that petition granted. Um, the French did not want slavery on their soil. They also didn't want black people in the country. They passed a law saying that you know, black people weren't supposed to come into the country, but they were pretty, they were not, they were pretty you know, lax about enforcing that. So, but even when people applied for their freedom, uh, the freedom was granted. So they could have done that. Jefferson um, writes a letter to someone who asks him about this and says, well, you know, I know of a person who brought a slave owner and didn't say slave over, but didn't say anything about it and hasn't been disturbed in his possession. Uh, but if they find out the law, then there's nothing we can do because the law is on their side. And of course, he's talking about himself. I, I know a person who brought someone over. <laughs> I have a friend. It was, I have a friend who had a friend who had a friend. Yeah. Um, and so he thought that they could be free. She thought that she could be free. And they don't take their freedom. Um, she, Madison Hemming says that when Jefferson is supposed to come home, Jefferson was going to come home 
for um, a leave of absence, to drop his daughters off. He was getting really, really concerned about his eldest daughter, who was of marriageable age. She's 17 years old, and which is marriageable age in um, Virginia and during that time period. And he, you know, he was terrified of the idea that she would, she found somebody there and got married to, she'd be living in France. So he was gonna take them, the girls home and drop them off and then come back. Um, at this point, Sally Hemings is pregnant and does not want to come back because she would be, her son said, re-enslaved. And she was also concerned about the status of her child, of her children. What would happen if she had children in Virginia? Because Virginia followed the rule partis sequitur ventrum, which means you know, the birth follows the ventrum stomach, but it means the birth follows the womb. You are what your mother was. And that was not the rule that the English colonists had come over with. The English colonists had come over with the rule is that you were what your father was. But if you think about uh, uh, in creating a slave system, why it would be better to say you are who your mother is. I mean, the, the sexuality of, of women is much more easily, was more easily controlled than that of men. Uh, if you were what your father was, you would have a lot more um, mixed race free people and they didn't want that. So she understood, and this is the other thing, this, people understood law. People don't think of enslaved people knowing anything, um, but she understood that. And Jefferson promised her that if she came back, um, their children would be free when they were grown, and she would have a good life at Monticello and come back. And so she's 16 years old, and you get to either falls for this or accepts this, however you want to call it, um, and comes back with him. So, and then she pretty much disappears from the family record once she's back. This, this is a girl who was his daughter's companion. She ceases to be their companion at this point, um, and they kind of go off into to their own own lives. And Jefferson goes into public life um, after this. There's a big scandal about this at one point when, when people um, uh, uh, sort of out them. But it doesn't matter to most people. He's resoundingly reelected re in the next election. No one cared. He bought Louisiana. Um, <laughs> and a lot more. And well, so I'd, just, yeah, so. I'd like to stay for a moment on, on that notion of James Callender and the oh. scandal because that's uh, something that it's kind of amazing that there was such controversy around your earlier book and around mm. the DNA, DNA tests. Uh, then to read that around the turn of the century, around 1800 and in, in that election, it was pretty well known mm -hmm. for people who cared to know that uh, Sally Hemings existed. Well, yeah, I mean, people, it's the interesting thing. The mistake is in thinking that a lot of the people who are still don't like this story of Jefferson and Hemings say, oh, this was just from this guy, James Callender, but people were talking about this before James Callender. And James Callender was James, a journalist. Ger James Callender <laughs> was a, James Callender was a, a journalist whom Jefferson had hired at some point to say bad things about John Adams. And, um, you know, it's always a mistake. I mean, he was, a, you know, he was a snake, right? You know, and so you bring the snake in and the snake turns around and bites you. Um, when Jefferson didn't do what he wanted him to do. He wanted to be made postmaster of Richmond. He was a, one of those very, very tough party stalwarts, you know, for the Republican Party, for Jefferson's party. You know, he, you know, attacked Adams. He was a mad dog. He did all those kinds of things. And then once he won the election, he says, now give me a job as a postmaster. And we're, Jefferson said- We're in said, Philadelphia. We're familiar with that political system. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and well, you know, well, then you know. You don't make the mad dog the postmaster. I mean, you, you, we, we let you out to do all those kinds of things. We're not going to bring you into the office, right? Um, and so he got upset, and that's when he tells the story about um, uh, Jefferson and Hemings. And as I said, it really didn't have any effect on, on Jefferson because people were focusing more on what he was the hero of the little man, the little white guy, not the, not the all people, the, the, the common man. That's who Jefferson uh, was the champion of. <coughs> And they didn't really care who he was sleeping with. Um, it was, he bought Louisiana. He says, we're going west. Let's go. And um, so he survived that. And 
people, it kind of was raised against him. Uh, John Quincy Adams uh, wrote a lot of poetry about Sally Hemings, a lot of <laughs> satirical poems about Sally Hemings, uh, attacking Jefferson, uh, making fun of Jefferson. And it's, it's a funny scene in the book when Jefferson is retiring from office, uh, uh, Quincy Adams comes up to him at the inaugural ball for, I mean, for uh, James Madison and says, and he asks, Jefferson asked him, so you've been writing any poetry lately? Uh, are you still fond of poetry, you know? And, uh, and, and Adams writes this to his wife and then he has poetry underlined. So you can clear that he knows that Jefferson knew that he was the author of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, just by the way, in terms of contradictions, John Quincy Adams, hero of Amistad and all that, you have things in the book about his views on race that are a sort of curl your hair. Well, you know, white people during that time period were racist. I mean, white supremacy was the doctrine of the time, and we're not, it's not like it's gone, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so this, was, this is the way people felt. Even people who were anti-slavery did not believe that whites and blacks should live together. Uh, and they certainly didn't believe that blacks and whites should marry each other and be part of a family and all of that. I mean, so John Quincy Adams' um, you know, racial views were not very different than Jefferson's. So before we sort of wrap up and go to um, questions from the audience, there's one figure that we touched on whose fate, when I read it, I didn't know it before I read the book, I just put down the book and just stared off into space. It was so upsetting, James Hemings. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell a little bit about you know, what um, James there? Hemings was Sally Hemings' older brother. He was the second of uh, the children of John Wales and Elizabeth Hemings. He was very, very talented um, man who um, Jefferson um, took to France with him uh, to learn how to become a French chef. Uh, as I was saying before, the Hemings brothers were treated very differently than the other enslaved uh, men on the plantation. Uh, lots of times Jefferson didn't know where they were. So his journey to France begins when he's uh, serving as a tour guide in Richmond and Jefferson writes down to someone who knew them, a mutual friend, and says, have you seen James? Tell him James to come on to me uh, to Philadelphia. We're going to France. And James says, no. Uh, He's going to go to Albemarle first, meaning he wanted to go see his family, which obviously makes sense before he heads off across the ocean. So Jefferson takes him to France. Um, he apprentices in some of the best castles, you know, some of the, the best cooks in, um, in, uh, in, in Paris. Uh, he becomes a chef de cuisine at the Hotel de Langeac. Jefferson pays him wages, uh, pays him very good wages uh, while he's there. Uh, he would have come back with Jefferson. And when Je I said Jefferson was going on a leave of absence, he would have come back with Jefferson. Uh, but we have a sense that, you know, when Madison Hemings says that Sally Hemings didn't want to come back, there's a hint that James Hemings might not have wanted to either because he hires a tutor near the end of his stay to teach him proper French. Uh, and you, it's not the kind of thing that you would think somebody would do if he wasn't taking all of this very seriously. He comes back with Jefferson, nevertheless, and Jefferson makes a deal with him and says, you know, I've paid all this money to, uh, to have you trained as a chef. You have to train somebody else, and then I will free you. And he trains his brother Peter, and Jefferson frees him, and then he embarks upon a life of travel. He goes uh, back to Europe. Um, Jefferson said he's, his next travel is going to be to the moon. He was, you know, on trap, play, make, playing a trip to Spain at one point, and Jefferson asked him, when he's elected to president to become the White House chef. But he wants Jefferson to write to him and ask him. And Jefferson is using a sort of another person to pull, to pull together his staff. And James wants him to write to him directly, and Jefferson refuses to. And so they have a tiff, uh, and they're sort of, they sort of make up at some point, and he ends up coming to, and Jefferson hires another person to be his chef uh, at the White House. But James comes back to work for him for a time at the White House. He's there for a couple of months. And then three months later, he goes back to Baltimore and he commits suicide. And um, he's a character, a, a person who, whom a lot of people feel attached to because he's so vibrant. And he's obviously intelligent. 
and you sympathize with somebody who has, who's, he has, there's no place for him. There's no place for a black man, you know, to, you know, a talented uh, person who, you know, has lived and traveled all the world and to come back to America and live the way, you know, people of African descent had to live. I and mean, we have these wonderful lists of all of the kitchen equipment in his hand uh, uh, that they brought back from Paris, um, that he brought back with Paris uh, with Jefferson. And it's just a, it's a tragic story. I tried to find, I went to Baltimore, I tried, I mean, I might try this again, I, to try to figure out what, what more uh, I could find out about what happened to him. But he is a very, very um, poignant figure. There's a number of questions that sort of tend to the same question. People want to know how the story ends with Sally Hemings' children in terms of who was freed and what did Jefferson do in his mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. and how does the contrast with what George Washington famously did? Okay. Well, well, George Washington died a very wealthy man and made provision for the freedom of his, of, of his slaves upon his wife's death, Martha's death. Um, she let them go early because there were a couple of suspicious fires. If you make somebody's freedom contingent upon your death. <laughs> <laughs> no to self. Don't no do no that. to self. Bad, bad move. Um, bad move. And which, which shows you, I mean, just, just like pause over that for a second, how unthinking he must have been about what's going on in the minds of the enslaved. Does he really think that, I mean, that that was not a risk, but that's another story. So in any event, so he frees slaves and people, much to his credit, uh, there are a number of people who are critical of him, mm -hmm. including Je uh, Jefferson's sec secretary, William Short, who said, if they still called him the general, if the general had done this while he was alive, it would have been a much better example. To free slaves after you're dead is a good thing. I mean, it's great for the slaves, but in terms of a, a message to the country overall, uh, people wanted him to do this while he was, he was alive. Jefferson uh, died bankrupt and um, People estimate over $100,000 in debt, which is a huge amount of money uh, during that time period. Um, and everybody thinks, it's, oh, he was drinking all that wine. Well, it was not that. There was that, but there was also the panic of, 18, of 1817. There, was, uh, there were two notes uh, for his grandson's father-in-law that he signed, uh, which is always, co-signing notes is always a problematic thing. Uh, and the guy defaulted, and Jefferson was in the, on the whole for like twenty, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for that. Um, bad luck, bad timing. If he'd lived longer and the Virginia economy rebounded, he might have been able to, you know, get back on, uh, you know, get back into some semblance of of, um, of, of solvency. But he didn't. Um, so what happened? Sally Hemings, uh, two of the children, Beverly and Harriet. Beverly is a male. William Beverly is a male run away as white people. They are not formally free. They're not given free papers because if you wanted to be a white person, you would not take free papers because then they would know you're not white because that would mean you were a slave. And so, so they run away and disappear. And we don't know who these people are. And that's the interesting thing about paper. See, if you, if you have any paper trail, people can find you. These people just disappear. So we don't know who, where they are. Um, Madison and Eston Hemings uh, were freed in Jefferson's will, along with three other members of the Hemings family, John Hemings, Burl Colbert, and Joe Fawcett. Um, Fawcett and Colbert are grandsons of, of Elizabeth Hemings. Um, Sally Hemings is not formally freed. Uh, she is given her time. Uh, Martha writes this, uh, that she's given her time years after Jefferson is dead, but in, she's listed as a free white person in a census in 1830. And they did a special census in 1833 in which they go around and ask black people in Virginia if they want to go back to Africa um, to, as far as part of emancipation expatriation. And she says, no, I don't want to go back to Africa. Uh, and she describes herself as having been freed in 1826. And she's listed, at, which is the year Jefferson died. Um, 
she's listed as a free um, colored woman in that, in that census. So she's not formally freed. She's informally freed. And people always ask me, well, why didn't he free her? Uh, because this is, you know, this being the big, you know, if you love them, why don't you free them? And, you know, that's, I, I'm not, I didn't mean to say it like that. I mean, I'm just making it. But, because who, I mean, she was over, you couldn't, in Virginia, you couldn't free a slave below 21 or above 45 without saying how you were going to take care of them. That's number one. You also, if you freed a slave, you had to, from the 1806 law, you had to petition the legislature to allow that slave to remain in the state. And if they, it was not granted, they would have to leave the state. So it seems to me, looking at this to me, and, and also, I don't think Jefferson, and this is, again, thinking about a person's mindset, I don't think he would have thought it proper to free a 56-year-old woman. That's hard for us to, to think. But that would have been his, his mindset. The only woman he ever freed, um, well, his daughter, he freed her informally. She's going off to live as a white person. She had, she had to be freed, because if she had a child, that child would be a slave. So she had to be freed. But I don't think he would have thought it socially acceptable to free a, an elderly woman, who at that stage was an elderly woman. But the main things are petitioning the legislature. That would have been an utter admission. We would have never argued about this if he'd petitioned the legislature. And then, according to the other law, said, and here's how I'm going to take care of Sally Hemings for the rest of her life. The easier thing to do, and it's what they did, she moves into Charlottesville with her sons, and everybody accept her, accepts her as a free white person. And the children, um, Madison Eston, stay in Charlottesville until she dies. And then they go out to Ohio for a time. Eston uh, decides to go into the white world. He changes his name to Eston Hemings Jefferson, E.H. Jefferson, and moves to Madison, Wisconsin. His children. You see it from the census in Virginia, they are you know, colored in, in, in Wisconsin, they are white, and they're now Jeffersons. And they become wealthy merchants. Uh, their daughters marry into a very good family. Um, and after a couple of generations, they lose the story of Tom and Sally. They become something else. And there are a number of people now who say, well, you know, the alternative story is Jefferson wasn't the father of Sally Hemings' children. It was Jefferson's brother. And people say, cause, and I knew they were going to say that once the DNA came back. I said, they'll find somebody else. All right, so it's the brother. And they said, aha, these fam this family says they were descendants of a Jefferson, another male Jefferson. Well, if you're passing for white, you can't say that you're de descended from Thomas Jefferson because everybody knows that Jefferson had no legal white sons. The only way you could be a descendant from Jefferson would be as if you were a descendant from Jefferson through a slave. They not only do they, you know, get rid of, of Thomas Jefferson, they get rid of Sally Hemings too. They don't know either one of these people. And so when Fawn Brody writes her book in 1974 and has Madison Hemings's recollections in the back. The family, the Westerians, who are descendants of the Eston Hemings line, go, oh my god, that's who we are. His family had totally, you know, Beverly Jefferson, he, he was named for one of, um, uh, for his uncle, you know, at this point. Uh, they had a number of people who'd gone to Princeton, Princeton graduates, that's where they went to school. And he'd been trying to do his family history, and he could only get back so far, and he couldn't figure out what the problem was. And it wasn't until Fawn Brody wrote her book that they were able to piece together the and story. It was Eston's DNA that was. It was Eston's DNA which, that was that was used in the DNA testing uh, on the. So Hemings. what was that moment like for you? Because you had written your book before the te the first book before the testing, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was you, interesting. You got beat up some for that book. Well, I got beat up some. I didn't get it beat up as much as I thought I was going to get beat up, <laughs> but. Um, it was interesting because I'd, you know, I'd gone, I'd given this talk at, at um, a church in Charlottesville, and someone said, uh, 
Winifred Bennett, it turned out to be. She was the woman who provided the money for the DNA. And she said, well, we're going to have an answer to this story. And, and I said, oh, it's going to be interesting. And she said, we're going to use DNA. I didn't find out later on at the that at the time she didn't have a precise test in mind. But <laughs> very soon they came up with um, Y chromosome testing, which would allow them to test. The Jeffersons had told a story. Um, the Jefferson family was adamant that um, the reason Sally Hemings' children looked just like Jefferson was that they were the children of his nephew, one of his nephews, his sister's child. And that's not a crazy story. I mean, I, I not great. People look like their relatives. I mean, my, uh, my husband's uh, nephews look like him. I mean, they're family, so that wasn't a crazy story. It's just that the way they told it was crazy. And I had a lot of fun in my first book going through that. <laughs> sort of tap dancing on that one. Uh, because, and it illustrated my point, and I, I should say this, my first book was not about Tom and, did Tom and Sally ha, um, uh, have a relationship. It was really about the way historians wrote about it. And so here you had this story about the Carr brothers told by Jefferson's granddaughter and grandson. And all throughout those documents, there were errors, and I don't mean small things, like you know, Madison Hemings says, my mother was in France for 18 months, and she was there for 26 months. Not stuff like that. Stuff like, you know, when Sally Hemings was having her children, I was responsible for handing out all of the clothing to the family. Or when Sally Hemings was to slaves. When Sally Hemings was having her children, he was between 8 and 12. He, he was not responsible for holding out, you know, handing out all the clothes. I mean, things that he could not have been mistaken about. And just lots of things like that that just were not true, and it didn't matter. And I knew that the historians who were writing about this knew that those, mis those things were mistakes. But those mistakes didn't matter. Madison Hemings is what we call in law de minimis mistakes, like time, two months versus four months. Those kinds of things were jumped on to say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And these huge things were overlooked because people wanted to believe what they were saying. So. Um, the car story is out there. Um, the DNA testing um, on these lines of people took about a year. So what was it like? It was interesting. It was like waiting for a jury to come back. I'm sort of yeah. sitting there. I've said all this stuff. And now science is going to come in and tell me whether I'm right or wrong. And what I really did not want, I, I did not want a car connection. Because that was just, I, I found that that whole story and the acceptance of that in the face of the really, really egregious things that people were saying was just intolerable. So I, I was very happy when um, you know, they called me on a Tuesday. Somebody from the Wall Street Journal called me and told me, said, well, asked me, well, what would you say if the DNA had come back? By the way, it hasn't come back. Uh, but what would you say if there was a connection to the car? And I'd say, well, I'd say this. And well, what would you say if it was a connection to the Jeffersons? I'd say, oh, I'd say that. Of course, it had come back. It was a complete lie. Um, and about two days later, uh, the next day, a friend of mine called me and told me the results. And this was like on a Wednesday. And they embargoed the story. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the country was supposed to write about it until Sunday, saving it for the Sunday newspapers. And so I talked to lots of different people during that week, did interviews with people. Because I was really surprised. Like from Australia, Denmark, all these places, all these people were just <laughs> fascinated by this, and it's on the front page of the New York Times. And so it really was, I mean, I was, yeah, I was in the Times like three times that week. And uh, I was surprised that it made that much of, you know, that, that big so of a So you've had a lot, a lot of time to think about this. Why do we care so much Why do we care about so much? this That's story about That's a good question. Jefferson? Because there's still people who are, you know, fighting uh, and, 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 uh, after. Why do we care? I think, I think we care for different reasons. I think they're, well, let me pull back. I think most people don't care. Mm -hmm. You got a room full of people. No, care. yeah, but I, you know, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think most Americans, they did a survey. They actually asked people, does this, res no, does this you know, revelation, does it change your attitude about Jefferson? And it was in the high 90s. People said no, not at all. And these were pe about people in terms of who like Jefferson. Mm -hmm. It didn't change it at all. Um, so it's it, people. He's he's. It's like 
that, that um, phrase, uh, path dependency. Mm -hmm. You know how, like the, we, we could have a better typewriter, a better way to do it, but it's just that we all have done it. It's so ingrained in our lives that we're not gonna do anything different. We're not gonna get rid of Jefferson. So even though, the, try as they may in my home state, remember <laughs> in Texas, they wanted to take him out of the history books. Yeah. Uh, people beat that one back. But you know, he's gonna, people are gonna take whatever is there and incorporate it and he's gonna go on. So that's not the real issue. But I, I think that there are some people who don't, who care because even though it doesn't change most people's minds about it, about him, people want, how can I put this? I think that it complicates the American story mm -hmm. to talk about a story of a mixed America, that America is not white has never been all white people. That it's about white and black, white and black and red. And there was all of this kind of mixing, all of these kinds of things going on that in some ways Jefferson is blackened if he was involved with somebody who was not white. And I, I really do think that that's the problem for a lot of people, that they feel that he, um, not that he, he wasn't degraded because he was a slave owner, he was degraded because he had children with somebody who was not white. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, that's a problem. And it doesn't make any difference, you know, if, if, even if the vast majority of people are able to incorporate that and go forward, I think for that cadre of people, it's an insult for them because he is not, he's not a white man and he must be a white man. We have a number of questions that are sort of struggling with the fact that he remained um, a slave owner. So I'm going to sort of ask a question which also borrows some from what you depict in the book. A lot of people are asking why a man this inventive and for the early part of his life this well off, mm -hmm. um, one who frequently paid wages to people who were his slaves, mm -hmm. sometimes let them roam free, why could Thomas Jefferson not figure out how to run Monticello without the slave system? Of all people, why couldn't he figure out how to do that? Well, I'm actually writing a book now with um, a man named Peter Onuf, who was the Thomas Jefferson Foundation professor at um, uh, UVA. And I just finished a chapter called Plantation, where I talked just very much about this. So I'm not going to tell you exactly the answer. I'm going to give you a version of it. Um, why he couldn't decide to do it because he wanted to live a certain way. I mean, you know, he had a way of life that he cherished. Uh, Monticello um, he cherished even more than the agricultural operations. Jefferson had a lot of slaves doing a lot of stuff like building that house that don't bring any money. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's not, you know, it's sort of, um, industrial kinds of things, you know, working on that house. Um, As you point I, out in the book, building that house was not easy. They had to cut off the top of the mountain. Yeah, level the mountain. I mean, it's a terrible place to have a, a, a plantation. I mean, the water, how do you get water up there? All this kind of stuff, all issues that are, that are they're very impractical. Um, Jefferson was a part of a class of people who lived a certain life, and he was not going to give that up. Um, it is not uncommon for people to have intellectual beliefs that they don't live up to, that they don't carry out. You can know something is wrong and believe something is wrong, but you do it. And, and particularly if the thing that you're doing brings you comfort, brings you positive things and good things. I mean, most of the people who are freeing slaves during this time period are people who are under the influence of religion. Quakers, Methodists, Baptists, for a brief period until, until, until upper class people started to become Baptists and Methodists. Um, there was a great, I mean, there was a sense of brotherhood and fellowship among people, but religion was a motivator for lots of people. Jefferson was not, Jefferson was a religious person in his own way, but he was not a conventional Christian. He was not somebody who believed in the divinity of Christ. Jesus was a good teacher. 
his, you should follow his precepts, but he didn't die and was raised from the dead. There were no miracles. So, you know, religion makes people do things that seem irrational, whether it's, and we certainly see that now in a, in a, in a, in a negative sense, but in a positive sense, the idea of giving up your property, giving up things because a calling in you, a spirit in you tells you that this is what you should do, that works for good and it works for ill. That didn't work in him because he did not have that kind of religious sensibility. And this is not an excuse for him, but I'm just saying, if you look at the people who did that, there was something that was motivating them. Most, in the main, it was a sense of either Christian, um, Christian virtue, Christian you know, um, duty to do it, but he didn't, that was not his thing. His was ethics, and ethics, ethics are, is, are, that's more rational than, than the irrationality of, of religion. So I, it was just never in him to do that. He also thought that slavery should end, that it should be a societal thing, that slaves, that everybody should free slaves, and that once slaves were freed, they should be expatriated. And this was the view, this was the quote unquote liberal position at the time because he didn't think that black people and white people could live together without conflict. That blacks would never forgive whites for what they'd done. Whites would never give up their prejudices against blacks. And there could be no wholesale mixture of black and white. Um, Alexander Hamilton uh, uh, teased him about this in a letter, um, says, well, well, he knows from his own life, essentially, that slavery was a way for mixing, for racial mixing. Um, and you know, what's the problem? And I think the problem is Jefferson wasn't so much racial mixing that bothered Jefferson when he's saying that you must remove them far from admixture, because he knew that there was mixing going on at, at Monticello. I'm not just talking about him, but just in general. Visitors there talked about the white slaves who were at Monticello. I think he was concerned about the prospects of black men having access to white women. Mixing was okay. The mixing that was going on in slavery was predominantly one way. It was male, white males to black females. But the prospect of a free society where, where black men had access to white women in the same way that white men had access to black women was a nightmare for him. So uh, that's, he can't have said that, you know, thought that slavery uh, was left people free from mixture because it definitely did. It definitely did not. As a final question, a number of people are sort of looking for your summing up or assessment. We have a man who basically, you know, a few blocks from here wrote the original American Creed mm -hmm. um, as President labored to create a vision of how the republic would work that still inspires people today bought all the land all the way out to Oregon, did uh, many great things, but did all the things also that we've been talking about here today. Where do you rank him in the pantheon, or is he even in the pantheon of, of great Americans, based on your The study? pantheon of great Americans. Uh, <laughs> I've not, not thought of it that way. Uh, he's in the pantheon of great Americans. Of course he's in the pantheon of great Americans. I mean. The flaws are there, there's no question about it, but that, I mean, greatness is not about, you know, gee, I like you, or gee, you do everything. Greatness is the effect that the person has on, 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 on a society, and he has had positive effects on the American society. Whether he would like it or not, I mean, the words that he chose in the Declaration of Independence have been used by everybody. Um, it's a document that, <coughs> Uh, people will talk about the Constitution as a living document. The Declaration is clearly a living document. People have used it all over the world. Um, they see it as, as something that's inspiration, and that he would say that, uh, that he would um, voice it in that way. Now, of course, he's saying he's expressing the, the kind, you know, the common mind of mankind, but the way he does it, uh, and uh, that he said it, um, has been of enormous importance. And so you can have somebody who is good in some sense, but doesn't give you anything like that, and then you have somebody who's flawed, but who gives you something that's a gem and that can be used by generation and generation. Uh, there's no question that he should be in the pantheon.
Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, thank you for your scholarship and thank you for sharing with us today.